Welcome to the Global Prayer Network, with Rev. Dr. Seth O. Lardy. We pray this teaching will impact your life, and bring you closer in your walk with Jesus. Let's get ready to receive today's teaching from, Rev. Dr. Seth O. Lardy. We are talking about going from average to an amazing personality. Going from just, quote unquote, a nobody to someone the world has come to love, admire, and adore. Not just because of your beauty, because as you know, Proverbs says that beauty can, can be fading away, but uh, that woman who fears God should be praised. And so let me just say to all of us that you can make it. There's nothing that will, God will put in your spirit, in your mind, that you cannot achieve. You've heard it said before. If you can conceive it, and what it is actually saying, if you can acknowledge what God is doing in your mind, in your spirit, if you can conceive it, and believe it, you can achieve it. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, how you go about achieving what God has placed in your spirit. Going all the way from average to an amazing person through two things, two things you need to make it happen. And those two things are what? Faith and works. Works and faith. The two must go together. And when you add those two elements, faith plus work, you will soon discover the hidden secret to go from average to extraordinary, amazing life. When you discover the secret, that really it is faith plus works. This is what sets apart those who succeed and those who do not succeed. And sometimes both of them are quote unquote religious people. They love the Lord. Are you listening? They pray, they fast, they worship, they believe, they can even speak in tongues. They can sing. They can preach. They can do it all. But listen to me. Listen carefully. If you are going to go from being an average person to all the way, an extraordinary personality, you know what will have to happen? You have to have faith and you have to have work at it. Because the truth be told, nothing happens until work is done. If you're a fisherman, no fish until you throw the net in the water. If you're a farmer, nothing happens until the seed is placed in the ground. If you are someone who Cook your chef. Nothing happens until you put whatever it is, meat in the water on the fire, flour stirred up with butter in the stove, in the oven. Nothing happens until work is done. If you're a tailor or your seamstress, nothing happens until you measure. You cut and you sew. Nothing happens if you're a builder. Nothing happens until you survey, you draw up some plans, you dig some foundation, lay some bricks, build some walls, put some windows, put some doors, put some toilets, don't forget that, put some kitchen. Nothing happens until work takes place. 
If you're a carpenter, you've got to cut, you've got to measure, you've got to use your hammer in order to do what? Nail, and that's when it happens. The book of James, and let me just read that for us. Because you may be saying, well, Doc, you know, we live in the modern days now, and um, we need to just work smart and not have to work hard. Whether you work smart or hard, at the end of the day, the key thing is that you have to work. And all over the world today, one of the things that we as a people will have to learn is to learn how to go back to the soil. If you read the Bible, all and most of the lands of the fightings in the Bible were over land and water. And I don't know who tricked us to think that if we abdicate, abandon, go away from the land, they will make us more civilized. That is not true. That's a lie. We will have to learn to go back to the soil. We're in South Africa. And I was talking to a gentleman. And he said to me, he said, Bishop, the people don't want to go back to the soil when they think about the apartheid regimes and what it did to them. They don't want to go to the soil. But guess what? If you don't go back to the soil, who's going to feed you? That's another form of slavery. If somebody has to determine how you eat, when you eat, and what you eat, that's another form of slavery. Not just in Africa, but here even in America. Most black people want to go to the urban cities and leave the land. Leave the land to who? So then eventually, those who put the seed in the ground will determine when you eat, what you eat, and how you eat. And that's why today, unfortunately, many of us are experiencing cancer. Why? Because a lot of the chemicals that are used to produce our food. Some of you can remember the old folk. They didn't use chemicals. They use other kinds of chemicals, body waste, et cetera, et cetera. All right, cow manure, et cetera. But today we want to be so modern until we find ourselves in hospitals, in nursing homes, et cetera, et cetera. What am I saying to you? We've got to go back to the soil and we have to work. Listen to what the book says. In the book of James, James chapter two. James chapter two. When you get some time, I want you to read the entire scripture and see what it says about work. It says here in the book of James chapter two, beginning at the 14th verse. I want you to listen to this. James chapter two, beginning at verse 14. It says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose, Suppose you see someone, let me get back to it. Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food, any clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself 
is not enough. Unless, unless, unless faith is added to works and then works produce something for all of us to enjoy. So let me say to you that if you really want to know the hidden secret, the hidden secret of those who succeed, the hidden secret is in works. You have to work. If you don't work, the scripture says you don't eat. And so James here says, I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God good for you. Even the demons believe that there's only one God. I hope you get the picture. Work is the secret ingredient to success. Work is the secret ingredient to success. Let's go on. And so faith without works is dead, which means if you say you have faith and you don't have any works to show it or with it, it means your faith is dead. And that's what's happening to so many people. They're walking around with dead faith. You say, well, Doc, I'm working. I'm working for someone. Wonderful. You are working for someone. In other words, that someone discovered their purpose. And because they discovered their purpose, you have come along to help them achieve their purpose. And nothing wrong with you helping somebody achieve their purpose, their goal, their mission in life. When will you allow somebody to help you achieve what God commissioned, commanded, instructed, anointed you to do? So result, you work 60 years, 40 years, whatever it is for somebody, and you retire. And long ago, they used to give you a gold watch and whatever the case may be. Today, they don't, they don't even take you to Golden Corral and give you something to eat. They just say, that's it. Call the security people to walk you out the yard. That's how ungrateful people are today. You gave them your blood, sweat, and tears. And in the end, they never show you gratitude. And why is it that way? Because we fail to understand when God sent you into this world, he gave you everything to succeed. Why do you think God said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, or subdue, and have dominion? He gave you everything you needed. The capacity to think. The capacity to dream. Yes, God has endowed you. God has equipped you with everything you need. The question is, are you gonna put it to work? Let me tell you what the word work means and, and, and listen carefully. Work means activity involving mental or physical effort done in order to achieve a purpose or a result. Now, what is that purpose? It is the purpose for which God created you. If you are working and you are not working to produce and bring into reality the purpose for which God created you, I would have to encourage you to please go back. Please go back and re-examine if you're just working for a paycheck, that's wonderful. But do you think God Almighty sent you into this world only to do somebody else's work and get a paycheck? I don't think so. 
I do not think God, and listen now, you see what people are doing these days? You hear in the conversation talking about AI? What is AI? Talking about artificial intelligence? If you know what's going on, they are manufacturing robots. Some of you go to the store today, they have self checkouts. Long, long time ago, you saw a lot of people standing there checking people out. If you notice what's going on, gradually they are replacing people with machines. And that's all right. That's somebody's intelligence that is doing that. But if you plug into God, you can come up with something better than that. If you know that what's happening, gradually they're removing people and replacing people with machineries. Believe it or not, they have now cars that will fly. So if you are living in uh, Missouri and you got to come to uh, North Carolina, you get in your car, you just fly, get there. They get into the place now where they're manufacturing cars without a driver. What they are doing, they are trying to go against God's law because it was God who said, you must work. But what some people are doing, they are doing whatever they can to prevent us from working. And so I said to you, work is activity involving mental or physical effort done in order to achieve a purpose or a result. If you really want to know the secret of success, it is in working. Now, I have to tell you this, work is one of the most essential prerequisites for achievement. No work, no achievement. You know, I know that this is a kind of a church related uh, Zoom activities here, but I can tell you, look at pastors, who are working, not just sitting behind a desk and look at their congregations. And then look at pastors who dress well, put on nice clothes, drive a nice car, and go sit down in the office. Look at their congregation. Look at the community. For most of our communities, with the number of churches that we have, we should be living in paradise. But somebody told us, get up and worship on Sunday. Very good. Shout. Very good. Dance. Very good. Fast. Very good. Sing hallelujah. Very good. But listen, after the shouting, after the singing, after everything, you still have to work because if you don't work, chances are you'll get hungry. And if you get hungry, chances are if you're not self-controlled, you may steal. And if you steal, chances are you may start your prison ministry. There's a time for worship and there's a time to work. You will hear me saying this all the time. And I don't mind saying it again. I know that in some countries, they have caste systems. In some countries, they have separation of people based upon the color of their skins, et cetera, et cetera. But let me say this. I know a little bit about America and I know a little bit about 
the black community. What if one day we got up and we saw signs that said, do not come in our malls. What if we got up and we saw a sign that said, do not come into our grocery store. What if we got up one morning and we saw where we couldn't even go to the bakery, the bakery because of the color of your skin? Many of us, if we don't have any refrigerator for 10 days, there is a large possibility, a high probability rather, that something bad will happen to us. What am I saying to you? If we are going to be a people to command, demand our future, we've got to be able to feed ourselves. We've got to be able to heal ourselves, that is, have our own hospitals. We have to be able to clothe ourselves, don't have to depend upon Amazon to send clothes overnight. We have to work. In a lot of instances, we are just pitiful. There's some African countries that have to wait for another African country to send them food. And they got good land. Listen to me. Do you know that once upon a time, Africa fed the world? Mm -hmm. And what happened then can happen again if we learn the principles of working because it is the most essential prerequisite for anything to happen. You know who started this business of work? God, God. The only difference with us and God, because he is so powerful, all he had to do was to say it. You go to Genesis, Genesis chapter one, verse three. And God said, verse six, and God said, verse nine, and God said, verse 14, and God said, verse 20, and God said, verse 24, and God said, verse 26, and God said, and after God said, God said, God said, in verse 31, listen to what it says. And it says, God looked at everything he had made and said, it is very good. Even God, almighty God, worked. God himself worked. Who told you you should not work? But now here's where we get it all confused. The work that you must do must be related to your purpose for being. It's good to work for others. But for heaven's sake, after you work for others, then it's time to work for yourself. I used to tell the people in the congregation, I said, listen, for some of us, we don't have the luxury to retire. Retire? What are you talking about retire? When you have 1.7 million plus young people drop out of school, Every year, you talk about retire? When many of our children are suffering, can I read or write? You talk about retire? Our community are ravaged with drugs, crime, and violence. You talk about retire? We don't have that kind of a luxury. We got to work. And listen to what God said. God said, when it comes to the business of work. Hmm. You know what God said? God said we should work six days. Six days. Some people who are successful, the reason they are successful because they work. You say, well, I'm working doctor. Yes, I'm talking about the work that God gave to you when he sent you into this world? What is the work that God put inside of you to do? What is the vision God put inside of you? To, what is the mission God sent you on? I hope you're getting the picture that if you wanna go from rags to riches, you gotta work. 
you know, today we all know Bill Gates. He has, he's a wealthy man. And we said to you that when you have wealth, it simply means that you have multiple streams of income. When you're a rich person, you have one stream of income. When you are a poor person, you don't have a stream. You hope that something comes along. <laughs> I'm gonna let you put that in the chat, okay? When you're wealthy, you have a lot of streams of income. When you're rich, you have one. When you're poor, it's questionable. But herein lies the secret. All of us, all of us, God gave you something to give to the world. And you have to take the time and find out, God, what is it you give me to give to the world? What is my mission? What is my purpose? And I guarantee you, God will show you what it is he sent you to do. And so God said, work six days. Do you think God wants you to go out here and work six days just to make somebody else rich? Somebody else wealthy? And you have to wait for payday, uh, a lending to, to, to add on to your, your little paycheck? I don't believe it. I do not believe God sent any singular one of us into this world to suffer. I don't believe it. I believe all of us, we have what it takes to rise to the top. But he said, you got to work six days. And then on the seventh, you want to what? Rest. And the kind of rest that he even talked about is not just going lying in bed and doing nothing. Because even the rest that he's talking about is a day to worship him. Six days, you do physical activities, soul activities, but the seventh day, you do spiritual things. You connect with God. You commune with God. You fellowship with God. And what does God do when you worship? Real worship supposed to inspire you. Real worship supposed to recreate in you a desire to keep pressing on. And when you leave the church house, you've got to be able to say, I've got a feeling something is going to happen for me today. Everything is going to be all right. That I'm going to work. I am going to work. Look at the people. And I'm thinking about America now because, you know, I've been here a few days. And some people had 10, 15 children. And some of those children went to college, became presidents and doctors, you name it. But they would tell you they never ever went to bed hungry. And you know, during those days, they didn't have any EBT cards. Mm -mm. No, they didn't have any kind of a extra snap way to get some. No, 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 no. They went to the soil in their backyards. They had enough to feed not just their families, but to feed the entire community. Look at us today. It can change. It should change. It ought to change. Because if we do not change and start feeding ourselves, start building ourselves, start protecting ourselves, guess what? It's not going to happen. Whether Africa or anywhere you find certain amount of people that are of the same color as you and I, we don't manufacture guns. We don't manufacture bombs. Why is it our communities are so infiltrated with guns and bombs? Who's doing that? And that's because we have derelicted our responsibilities to fulfill the dream, the aspirations, the purposes 
that God has called us to be and to do. I want to encourage you, whatever you do, look in your soul, search within, find out, God, what is my reason for being on this planet Earth? Don't be like Methuselah. The only thing we know about Methuselah, he lived and he died. That's it. You don't want to live and die. And even after that, we still have to pay your Dollar General credit card. Mm -mm. Inside of you, there is something great. You know what the Bible said? Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. The Bible said, now unto him who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all, we can ask or think according to the power that's at work inside of you. You are an awesome, marvelous, wonderful individual. The Apostle Paul said, you are God's masterpiece. What problems do you see that needs to be solved? Go solve it. What conditions you think need to be taken care of? Go see about it. That's where your reputation, that's where your success is going to come from because you solve a problem or you met a need. The lit robber Shula used to say that if you find a need, Meet it. If there's a hurt, heal it. What is he saying? The way how you can become what you're supposed to be is because you saw a need and you solved it. Look at today, AARP. AARP, the last time I checked, it could be more, don't quote me on it. They had over 14 plus million members. Over 14 million plus members. And what many of us don't know, we think that AARP is only a nonprofit organization. I discovered AARP has two for profit organizations. It was either 2019 or 2018, they grossed over $400 million. Where did AARP start? One woman who saw a need. She saw a need that teachers were not being treated properly. She saw a need that, guess what? The elderly were not being treated properly. She couldn't get even insurance. And she set out to make a difference. The Red Cross, one person, a lady from her sick bed, did not stop until we have Red Cross today in America. What is it that is bothering you? What is it that you are concerned about? In that particular thing that is disturbing you, it may be the genesis of what God sent you here to do. Go to work. Make it happen. Let me wrap it up by telling you how important work is. In the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah was one who had been brought to a foreign land and he worked in the house of the king. And every time people came from Jerusalem who would come by the palace, they would tell him, Doc, things are bad for us in Jerusalem. We are looked down upon. People don't treat us right. We are a disgrace. Our walls are falling down. Nobody cares for us. Nehemiah said, really? But he did not just become concerned. Listen to what the text says. It says in chapter one, 
he was told the walls were down. In verse 4 of chapter 1, listen to what he did. He did what? He cried. It was so bad, he cried. Now, when a man goes to crying, you know it's gone pretty bad. Because we try to think that we're so tough that we don't cry. But the truth is, real men do cry about situations. He wept. Not only did he weep, but he moaned. I mean, he just, he just went down into a depressed state. And not only did he moan, but guess what? It says he fasted. Not only did he fasted, but he prayed. You would think that after mourning, crying, praying, and fasting, something was supposed to be done. No, no, no. Listen to this. The scripture here says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. He would direct your path. It didn't say, in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll provide everything. No. Even he said, my God will supply all of your needs. Remember the word supply. Supply means the material. If you're a farmer, the seed. If you're a builder, the material. God will send the material, but you have to put it in the ground. You have to build it. So listen, Nehemiah moaned, he wept, he fasted, etc. But in chapter 2, he took action. He went to Jerusalem. He inspected the walls. He discovered what the situation was. And this is very, very important because in chapter 2, it says in verse 17, he involved others. He involved others. What am I saying to you? When God gives you a dream, when God gives you a vision, you, you can't do it by yourself. You need others to come help you get it done. And that's what happened to most of us. We are helping others to make it happen. Well, that's not the real essence of a barter system. In a barter system, it says, I have salt, you have sugar. I need sugar, you need salt, and we exchange. That's what economy is supposed to be, the exchange of goods and services. No, you cannot just be a consumer. You've got to also be a producer. If you're only a consumer, it means that those who are producing will hold you hostage. They are easily prone to enslave you. The basis of economics is the exchange of goods and services. It's not just consuming. One group consuming, another group producing. It doesn't work that way. So what am I saying to you? Nehemiah involved others, the, the people in the town. He called them together. He said, let us rebuild the walls. And listen, this way you need to remember the reason you fasted, the reason you prayed, the reason you talked to God about it. Because guess what? When you start the work, it will not always be easy. When you start the work, there's some folk who will talk about you. When you start the work, there's some who will criticize you. When you start the work, some folk will walk away from you. When you start the work, it will not be easy. But if you talk to God about it, God will keep you. God will sustain you. God will strengthen you, even when they criticize you. Even when they walk away from you. And that's what happened to Nehemiah. There was a guy and his cousin called Sam Ballard and Tobias. They made life live in hell for Nehemiah. They really did. But because Nehemiah had fasted, because he had prayed, because he had talked to God about it, God kept it. That's why you got to pray. That's why you got to fast. So that when you start to work and things get difficult, you can always go back to God and say, God, it was you who told me to do it. God, it was you who inspired me to do it. God, it was you who told me I should get out here and get this thing done. Now I need some help. And guess what? God would do it. So he experienced criticism. 
but because he was dependent upon God, God gave him inner strength. And it says in chapter four, chapter four and verse six, you've heard this so many times. Chapter four, verse six says, so build we the walls for the people. The people had a mind not to pray, not to just shout and sing, not to just dance all over the place, but the people had a mind to work. Think about it in your own house. If the dishes in the sink, if you don't stop to work to wash it, it would never get washed. It can be there for 30 years. Your room, if you don't stop to straighten it out, it would never be. Your house, nothing happens until action movement takes place. And so if you really want to know the, the, the secret of success, listen to this formula. I want you to write it down. It's purpose plus people plus work equals significant achievement. You got to have a purpose. You got to involve some people. And then you got to work. And if you do it, something will happen. God worked, he has a creation. Jesus worked, and we have given us salvation. Now we have to work to make a difference in somebody's life. The song said, as he died to make men holy, let us also die to set men free while our God, while our songs, while our dreams, while our efforts are marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. My sisters and my brothers, if you wanna go from the bottom to the top, you can do it. The secret, is to know your purpose, find a situation that needs to be repaired, and go find you some people who God will send you. Go to work and make it happen. And guess what? If it can happen for others, it can happen for you. Yes, it can. I know of a preacher He's dead now, but he started with himself, his wife, his son, his brother, other two people, and that minister built a ministry to almost 15,000 persons. Yes, it just didn't happen. He worked. Bill Gates. There was a the thing that catapulted him to where he is today. He had an assignment to create a system for a school for the registration process. And guess what? Him and his friend, they went, got a room, and they stayed in there until they developed the formula. He worked. Mr. Warren Buffett, one of the richest men, he works, his, reading, his work is reading. He reads some 80 hours a week. What am I saying to you? If it happened for others, it can happen for you. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's rise up. Let's make a difference in our generation. Find out God's purpose for your life. Find a situation, find a trouble, find a condition, and go solve it. 
because the more problems you solve, the more value you bring to yourself. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen, amen, and amen. Do we have any question? Any question on what you just heard today? We've been talking about how to go from average to how to become just a wonderful person. We give you all of these steps. I hope they've been a blessing to you. Any question before we go to God in prayers? If you have a question, put it in the chat. If you have a question, put it in the chat for me. All right. All right, somebody says, how do we guard against becoming prideful when we get to our amazing moment? How do we avoid becoming prideful? Well, let me tell you, I can tell you, the way you avoid becoming prideful, and I want you to listen to me now because what I'm about to tell you, uh, you would say, really? The way you become humble is to always remember that what happened was not you, but God did it. God did it. You hear me all the time saying, by his grace, by his grace. Yeah. This individual that you're looking at, do you know that by the grace of God, the supervisor and I, in our ministry, God helped us to be able to make a contribution in this country worth over a hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. But you don't see me walking around with people surrounding me. And, no, 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 no. Why? Because I know, I know who helped us to do it was almighty God. If ever you are in America, if ever you are in Winston-Salem, come, we'll show you. Go to Asheville, North Carolina, we'll show you. God did it. God's favor. And if you remember, don't you ever forget that it was God's favor that made it happen. And sometimes I tell you, God will really make you to know he did it for you. You think Nehemiah could boast that he did it? No. Number one, the king provided the resources. Number two, Sanballat and Tobias were there enough to keep him praying that he, that he didn't have time to feel prideful. So to your question, the way you avoid becoming prideful is in fact to remember every day who did it. Who did it? God did it. Who did it? God did it. And for me, the way how I keep myself in check is by remembering constantly continuously it was all because of god and that's why you hear me often would say is by his grace and i'm not saying it just to be kind of a pious and the rest of it no i really really have come to know if god had not done it it would not have happened i'm telling the truth i have some stories to tell you how god can do it and if he did it for me he can do it for you if he did it for us he can do it for you too god did it Yes, remember that. Amen. Thank Amen. you for watching and make plans to join our live audience on Zoom each weekday at 12 o'clock noon Eastern Standard Time. Log on with Zoom ID 898-0388-5432 and enter password 821074. Visit us online at www.sathlardy.org.
and please remember to subscribe to this channel. I feel like prophesying.